I'm Phil Dobby and welcome once again to the Debunking Economics podcast with Professor Steve Keen. And today we ask, does modern monetary theory make sense? Well, welcome to this free edition of the Debunking Economics podcast. If you're a supporter of Steve Keen on Patreon and you're paying $10 or more per month, or if you're a subscriber to these podcasts at debunkingeconomics.com, you can hear podcasts like this once or twice a week in full, looking at the theory behind economics and how it relates to everyday life and world events. Now, on the face of it, a lot of what Steve Keen says and believes in seems to reflect modern monetary theory, or MMT, for those people who like acronyms. MMT states that because the government of a country is the monopoly supplier of money, it has unlimited capacity to pay for things and provide funds for other sectors. So being in surplus, in effect, is, is a bad thing because that means they've taken more money in taxes than they're spending, so they're withdrawing money from the private sector. So why not always run a deficit? Well, Steve, I mean, we've uh, spoken a lot about this before, and Paul Krugman, not surprisingly, uh, amongst others, says that the theory ignores the inflation you'd get if you kept creating money. Maybe uh, not an issue now, but as the economy grows, um, that's got to be a point. So uh, at this very basic level, though, it seems like you do agree with the, the, the whole theory behind modern monetary Theory. Yeah, I, I, I do. I've got some some uh, clar- some uh, caveats of my own in my own approach to it, um, which are partly based on my own different starting point for analysing the economy rather than a difference in uh, final conclusions. They effectively start from the government as a sovereign money creator. I start from the private sector as a money creator, and then add add the government in because I think you have to understand how a closer to a pure free market economy operates uh, because so many people who uh, will tell you how wonderful, for example, uh, free banking is, are hypothesising about a world in which there is no government regulation. So, okay. But we coincide with, on, on, the, on, on the Paul Krugman and inflation that it's typical shallow reading by Paul Krugman. <laughs> I, I, and yet you love him so much. I do. Let's, there's so many reasons to love him, honestly. I mean, what's not to love? Let's go back a notch. You said um, the, your difference is they talk about the government creating money. You you start with the private sector creating money. But in yeah. terms of those physical notes, they do come from the government. Oh, yeah, the physical. And this is one thing people can't deny. And, of course, it confuses them at the same time. So they they, they say, oh, it's government-created money, fiat money, et cetera, et cetera. And they imagine them, their vision of money is those little pieces of green paper. But, of course, if we tried to do everything in modern commas, little pieces of green paper, there'd be black holes formed wherever Elon Musk wants to build a a new battery uh, battery operation. It's all electronic transfers. It used to be paper currency, and in a literal sense of the word paper currency, as Graziani first spoke about it, which means checks. Mm. Um, so the vast majority of transactions have been effectively transfers between bank accounts, and that's the um, that's the part the, the perspective that I start from. Right, but if I wanted to, but if I wanted to do something, if I wanted to create that rocket, I would have to borrow money, and I have to borrow money from a bank, and the bank would therefore uh, either have that money or it would. Create the money and uh, if they can't create the money they'd create that they'd get the central bank to create the money so that so that that rocket is still being funded by money that might ultimately be created by the government isn't it well let's see it's, it's it's government with money which is sanctioned by the government in that sense but uh, if you the, the, the basic starting point of modern monetary theory and the approach that I take as well is to say you've got to see the world through the lens of monetary flows and monetary stocks and the best way to do that is to use the the invention of accountants from 500 years ago which is double entry bookkeeping so i i and i must say on this particular point i was behind the uh, behind the ball compared to the modern monetary theory crowd uh, initially because i didn't appreciate the importance of double entry bookkeeping not just as a framework but as a way of understanding capitalism uh, until i designed minsky and if you look at Minsky, they'll see on the top left-hand corner of what I call godly tables, there's a little checkbox to allow single entry. So when I first started building my uh, monetary models, uh, they were single entry, but there could be one or two entries uh, on each on each row. They didn't have to sum to zero. And I've realised since that that particular little uh, device of having a p- positive and a negative entry in every row, so that the rows necessarily sum to zero, and you therefore can't make stock flow errors in your logic, uh, is important. And once you do it, you also realise how banks create money and the government too. Let's just touch on this thing about inflation again very quickly. Imagine, yeah. there's, imagine there's, I don't know, let's say there's $2 trillion in existence and uh, and I'm a government and I owe a trillion 
so I could print a trillion, uh, but that means each dollar is now going to be one third less because because uh, you know we've now got three trillion dollars rather than two trillion dollars. So I have to print a trillion plus the one third to cover the uh, the one third I've just created. So. Aren't we going to continually devalue the currency if we do that? Because, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, isn't it also going to make everything that's in existence a lot more expensive? So that therefore becomes inflationary. Well, that's first of all, the modern monetary theory crowd do consider what happens when you have economy going gangbusters and you print more and you, and you create more money. Yes, you're going to put additional inflationary pressure that could turn up in either an increase in price levels or an increase in the trade deficit or both. So they are aware of it. What they're saying is that at the moment we and this is this is one area in which we we spoke in one of last week's podcasts, I think, uh, about the unemployment rate versus the employment rate. We're still in a world where there's additional demand and needed, certainly for the American economy. So there's plenty of room. And at the same time, of course, this is what I find this amusing because even 18 year olds, I kind of said old fuddy duddies like you raising this one with me, <laughs> uh, but e- even 18 year olds have never known anything, anything greater than 2% inflation. Yeah, still talking about it. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The first response is, but won't that cause inflation? Yeah. And I say, yes. And aren't central banks trying to cause that right now and failing? So it's amusing how much this has become a bogey that seems to inhabit the human psyche. Right. Well, talking about jobs, I mean, one one argument in, in, in favour of modern monetary theory is that is this that it can be used to fund a job guarantee. So there's no such thing as involuntary unemployment. So if there's not enough jobs to go around, then the government has the ability to say, well, okay, we're going to put money in where they put it is the next question of course we're going to make the call we're going to, we're going to try and re- remove this involuntary unemployment is that a good idea well this, let's go back a couple of steps because it's easy to get caught up in the in the what's going to happen if type stuff without actually working out what uh, what if is in the uh, in the first place actually sure. yeah. requires and fundamentally <clears throat> you, you, you we do not live in a barter economy Everybody except economists realise that. The economist model of the world is if it's a barter system. And therefore, by, this is near mainstream economists, of course. If I leave, they leave money out of their thinking entirely. If money turns up, it's derivative of what they call the, the deep parameters of the system, the real factors that they say drive uh, consumer taste on one side and firms desire to invest on the other. No banks whatsoever, no money necessary, everything's barter. And then they start giving guidance about how much money you should create. Now, in their theory, the only thing money creation can cause is inflation, and therefore they set the whole thing about uh, rates of growth of the money supply to, uh, uh, to, to reach monetary targets or rates of interest that are going to reach those monetary targets, uh, inflation targets. That's all they do. So they're completely ignoring the actual process of creating money. Now, when we live in the real world, uh, let's make a concession to the real world. It uses money. Money has to exist for commerce to take place. And therefore, if you only had one source of money and you wanted your economy to grow over time, there's two ways that can happen. One is the price level falls. Now, that's fine in a world in which there's no debt. But if you have a falling price level and debt's denominated in normal terms as they are, uh, then your debt burden rises with every increase in output and bang, your increase in output's not going to go very far. Consequently, the only economies which have sustained uh, growth over the long term in terms of uh, change, increase in real output have also had increases in the money supply. And therefore, you have to have a rising money supply to have rising rising output. So to some extent, uh, there, there's an imperative on whoever creates the money supply to create it. Now, when you look at what uh, the mainstream ends up doing, they're arguing basically in favour of the government either running a balanced budget all the time or frequently you look at the Riccardian equivalent mob, uh, a surplus until such time as the government disappears up its own abscissa. Now, that is actually selling the economy, let's grow while just destroy the money supply. Now, only people who didn't realise money was necessary for capitalism could actually say that. So in some ways, mon- modern monetary theory, even though it's being critiqued uh, half the time by the mainstream and by people in the, in the street, is actually a counter to the insanity of the mainstream effectively believing you could operate in a world without money. So is it... I'm- I mean, is it an opportunity that money has created that we've been ignoring because we've been operating that's, the way we operated before money? Because, of course, when we bartered, yeah. the you know the availability of resources was how much stuff we had to barter. When we were tied to the gold standard, we were controlled by how much gold there was. Now we've basically said, well, we're going to print money. There's no control, uh, and we haven't got used to that yet. Well, a combination. First of all, we're never. This is where David Graeber's work is so useful, and also Michael. 
Michael Hudson's and Cornelia Wunsch's, we haven't ever bartered. On a, on a global scale, the, amount, the level of transactions that were ever uh, with pure barter were, were, were minuscule. Most exchanges were credit exchanges to begin with, uh, whether that was before we actually developed money or after we developed money, whether they were credit-based rather than barter-based. So money's always been there in, in a sense of, of credit being there. But what, you, what, what we are failing to realise is that we have, one of the reasons we have unemployment is insufficient money. Now, why is there insufficient money? Is it is it impossible to find the stuff? Can't is it? Do we have? Is it really hard to find where the mines are and dig it up? No, it's bloody double entry bookkeeping. That's all you need to create the stuff. So the point of modern monetary theory and also the uh, ideas of a job guarantee and so on are that if you have unemployed resources, if there's slack in the economy, uh, then there is room for the government to fund that in some sense. Uh, whether that's by direct projects or by something like a job guarantee or a basic income, there's no physical reason why it can't create that money. So the shortage of money is a sign of our lack of understanding of how to create it, not because it can't be physically created. But can't a government also say, well, look, we want to raise money, so we're going to issue bonds rather than uh, saying we're going to create money per se? This is the complicated rules they actually go through, and this is why the money creation takes place. And this is why, again, you've got to think in terms of double entry bookkeeping. So we start with the Treasury that decides the level of expenditure for the year ahead. Now, it might want to target a surplus, so all these total fantasies are running a surplus, but they often do they do their sums, they forecast forward, and they see that their expenditure is going to be greater than their tax revenue. So let's say the difference is a, is a, is a billion dollars. You know, let's say you're a trillion dollar, trillion dollar economy and a $10 billion difference. The Treasury then issues tr- bonds for $10 billion. Now, if you and I were in the same situation, happy to have a revenue of a trillion dollars, of course, mm. but if you and I issued bonds worth $10 billion, $10 billion we couldn't spend a cent until those, one of those bonds was sold. Because we can only spend what's in our bank accounts. When the Treasury creates those bonds, on the other hand, then as soon as that happens, the central bank authorises spending from the Treasury's account. So there's the, the fact that it is the, um, the government's bank means it simply accepts that the government will get that, uh, that, that money, however it does it. Then the bonds are sold. Now, when the bonds are sold, they're bought normally by the financial sector. They used to be bought by wealthy individuals. Think back to the days of uh, Charlotte Bronte and so on. People would talk about their, their government, their holding of consuls being their major income source. So, uh, but then the, the, these, these days, right, they're sold to financial institutions rather than directly to rich individuals. Now, that then means that, that, that say, let's say that there's a, a 10 billion issued and those rich individuals only want to buy uh, 5 billion, which is always the, the bond vigilante worry people have got. The central bank then comes and buys those 5 billion worth of bonds off those private individuals, leaving them with zero. So they go and buy another 5 billion, which means they've bought all the bonds the government wants to issue. Mm. Now, when the, when, the, when the central bank does that buying of bonds, it creates money. So that's partly one of the money creation mechanisms. Equally, now that the Treasury has the right to spend, then it, what, the way it spends is it will make an entry, uh, let's say just a straight, un, un, um, let's, 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 let's say it's a pension check and you've and I've reached, the, uh, I've reached the ripe old pensionable age. So they, they whack, a, you know, in my case, a, a, a hundred pound uh, entry in my bank account. Now that is matched by a hundred pound increase in the reserves of the bank that I'm banking with, and that is a transfer of money from the treasury's account at the central bank to the bank's account at the central bank. So that is also then creating money that I spend into the economy. So those are the mechanisms, and right. because because the central bank necessarily honours any spending by the treasury, the treasury is not money constrained. So if that's the way it's done, so that's in effect how this the, this approach of modern monetary theory is being executed in in, in the real world, and that's yeah. that's happening, isn't it? I mean, you know, we've got the oh, it's European- exactly it's exactly what's all, all, all in some ways all MMT is doing yeah. is describing the real world. Yeah. Now neoclassical theory is telling you about a fantasy planet on which everything happens by barter and money is irrelevant. Right. So when so for example, the European Central Bank has issued a lot of bonds. The U.S. government's issued a lot of bonds. The U.K. government. I mean, everywhere 
uh, mm. people are, are issuing bonds to try and um, kickstart their, their their various economies. So they're mm. in effect they are being proponents of modern monetary theory in that case, aren't they? Except for the fact that they are saying, "Well, we want to pull back on this at some point." And they're doing less of it than they should do. This is the right. point that MMT makes that there's the only limit to the amount you should do is is the functional impact of doing it. This is where it comes from a, a set of papers by a guy called Abel Lerner back in the uh, early post-war period, or maybe even the, during the end, of the end of the Second World War, I think. And he realised this basic point that the limits to government spending are not practical, they're functional. Now, if you and I ran out of money, that's it. We've got yeah. to beg, yeah. okay? Okay, we can't spend. But the government can't do that because it underwrites its own, it has its own underwriting bank within its own system. And if you and I owned a bank of Keen and Dobby and people would accept whatever we wrote on those as money, then we can increase our assets and increase our liabilities and, and spend out of the liabilities without ever running out of money. Of course, we can't do that. So if you think about it, this is actually a, a lovely perspective from one of my favourite and unrecognised economists, Janos Korn, I think one of the great intellectuals of uh, the last 50 years, a Hungarian economist. Janos, in trying to analyse why socialism grew so slowly, whereas capitalism grew uh, fitfully but rapidly over time, coined the idea of what he called demand-constrained versus resource-constrained economies. But he also talked about institutions in a Soviet system having called a soft budget constraint, which meant their spending wasn't limited. If they wanted to spend more than they actually had, they'd do it and the state would then top them up later. Well, fundamentally, the state in a capitalist economy has a soft budget constraint. And that's, and that, that's what MNT is saying. Effectively, you've got that soft budget constraint. It's not a hard one. You don't have to run out of money. You don't have to worry about future debt because as long as you're servicing it in your own currency, you can never run out of the capacity to do that. It comes down to whether you're having to borrow money in foreign currency. Uh, and this comes back to the trade deficit, which is one point of difference with MMT that I do want to get to. Um, so the, all this stuff is functional reasons to limit the level of government spending, not practical ones, which we you and I face. Right. This is presumably why China is doing so well then. Fundamentally, yeah. I mean, that's the classic MMT uh, uh, economy. And just basically spend, 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 because we can create the money. People accept from MMDs internally. You do not dishonour what the Communist Party gives you as money. You accept it. And bang. They're, 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 and now that gives them a tremendous capability to get out of the private credit uh, bubble trap they're definitely in uh, because all they have to do is switch over to government spending, which they're doing on a fairly large scale. And it looks like a lot of their so-called aid projects that are taking place in places like Kazakhstan, building the Silk Road again. Uh, that is effectively a way of guaranteeing full employment back in China because they're doing it using Chinese goods and Chinese workers. And the aim of it is full employment. Would that be the, you'd keep on doing it until everybody had a job fundamentally, until you've used all of your labour resources uh, effectively? Yeah, and that's, that's the objective. And that's what MMT is saying as well. There's no reason to have unemployed labour. Uh, the reasons to uh, relate to what we use the labour for, and that's where, of course, I've got to put the ecological caveat in here. A lot of people say you can't have growth through it. I know that. Uh, but... Uh, the un the situation we're in right now with unemployment and the state of the financial and economic and political system, uh, we're going to stuff up the, the ecology anyway. I'm very, very, very cynical on that front. But um, but fundamentally, yeah, if you've got unemployed people, uh, then the, the reason for unemployment is the government's not spending enough. Now, you can take it too far. And, and on that particular point, I do want to raise uh, two issues. One is uh, this idea of what happens on the on the uh, trade balance for yeah. countries that run excessive surplus, but also um, I'm going to be having a fight with one of the MNT authors this year. He already knows it uh, because he's arguing effectively by a far much far much extrapolation of logic to say effectively because effectively argument the economy be fully employed were it not for government and government creates unemployment so it can do public works with them i think that's nonsense uh, and equally uh, another one of the modern monetary theory people warren mosler argues that uh, exports are a cost and imports are a benefit and running a trade deficit is a good idea and i think it's an utterly american-centric idea it does not reflect what a clause in the rest of the world where you don't actually have the reserve currency as your domestic currency. But if I'm yeah, on that, on foreign trade, if I'm pumping government money into the economy, I'm going to be devaluing my currency on it. I'm going to be m making my exports cheaper. So isn't that what uh, uh, Donald Trump would call c uh, currency manipulation? Well, it depends on whether everybody else is doing the same thing. And you, mm. you've, if, you, if you've got an economy which is growing at a nominal 5% per annum, and a real rate of three, which is the sort of goal that when you think about what the uh, 
Reserve for the Fed Reserve in America has as its targets. That's precisely the rate that it expects: two percent rate of inflation, three percent rate of 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 of, of growth. Uh, you have to have a five percent increase in the money supply every year to make that possible. Yeah. Okay. So where's it going to come from? Well, two possibilities. It comes from the financial sector. If you have to borrow that money from the banks, then your debt level is going to rise along with the increase in the amount of money. Now, that's the trap we got caught in uh, in the, in the uh, 2007 because, because the government was not doing its bit for money creation, trying to run a surplus instead, and the economy was growing. It was growing because people were borrowing money from the banks, increasing their assets, increasing their liabilities, inflating the value of their, uh, of their um, physical assets, houses and shares, courtesy of that whole process. That looked like it was balancing for a while. Uh, but all based on a bubble. And when the bubble burst, bang, the value of the assets they'd purchased with that money disappeared. They still had the liability of the banking sector and we had a financial crisis. So you don't want to have a reliance solely upon the government, uh, upon the banks because this will be a recipe for a, for a later financial crisis. You want to have the government doing it as well. And the question is, isn't it whether the government should or should not run a deficit? It's what size should it be? So the whole idea of economics the fundamental argument about why we uh, why we study economics is because it's the way of making the best use of limited resources so doesn't this theory sort of go against that a little bit in that we're, in that we're, the we're theory is bu- the theory is bullshit <laughs> this is, this is okay. one of the many i mean this this would you believe that phrase about economics being the study of the, the allocation of scarce resources when unlimited wants was written in 1932 33 by lionel robbins who at the time a was an austrian economist and b was surrounded by the great depression right now admittedly the, the, the british wasn't as bad as the american one but the unemployment rate in america was 25 26 percent when he wrote that bloody line i think there's something about unlimited resources <laughs> then why are you using one quarter of the labor yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's insufficiency of demand. And this is why I think Janos Kornai's insights are so important. And when I finally write my magnum opus, I'll play a major role in them. And that is this capitalism is demand constrained. It's not resource constrained. So this vision of economics being the study of a kind of, of a, a unlimited uh, wants and limited resources is fundamentally the problem of a socialist system, which is resource constrained. And this is Janos's point. So... Uh, so, but, we do, but we do hit the problem, don't we? If we don't have that uh, that, that, that expectation that we are going to limit ourselves somehow, then the, the damage we're doing to the planet is the ultimate. Uh, well, that's uh, I mean, that, that's 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 an engineering task, and we should be looking at it that way. Mm. I think I think we're well past the point where there's any chance of avoiding a two or three percent increase in the temperature. I'm totally. I mean, I've I've been reading this literature for sixty years. Um, 60 years, no, 50. I'm not quite that old. Uh, but 50 years of reading this literature on on uh, global warming, on resource constraints, thermodynamics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it is just we're on a hiding to nothing to crack to three and four degrees of Celsius increase. Right. And in that situation, we're going to need massive engineering at the same time as having massive chaos as well. But, yeah, it's an engineering task. It's got well past the stage of whether we can constrain. We've already got past that limit. So we should be using economics not for making the best use of limited resources that's an old-fashioned idea we should be using it to make sure that everybody is gainfully employed and i guess also making sure we're all happy would be quite a nice thing and uh, modern monetary theory is a is a step towards that so just finally then mm. how do you differ again how do i differ yeah what, mm. what what's your main okay, point of difference two, two points of difference are first of all i think that in focusing upon this the government's capacity to be a sovereign money creator to some extent they've dropped the ball on the role of the private sector this is not the case for win godley of course in the first instance whose work underpins both their work and mine but it's in when you talk, see about how they argue they uh, tend to not to, uh, to, to talk about uh, sovereign and subject talking about the sovereign's capacity to create money uh, and the subjects uh, the, the, the being uh, receiving that money and using it rather than seeing uh, it's but it's it might be sovereign and subject but it's also debtor and creditor uh, when we're talking in terms of private banks versus the non-bank financial and non-bank uh, economy which you and i are part of so there's partly lack of attention and i think it's it, it just hasn't got taken itself far enough i'm trying to to do what i think is the, the technical and communicative ways of extending it and I, i'm just a bit critical of them for not going far enough themselves and explaining to people how this functions just by sticking they stick with the sovereign and subject and think that's going to convince people it won't so that's so that's a, a sort of developmental and and pedagogic uh and partly polemic uh, area of disagreement the main practical ones are twofold um 
there's particularly coming out of Warren Mosel and what's called Seven uh, um, Seven Deadly, I've forgotten the actual term, but a, a free book of his, which he put out when he was running for a president, I think back in 2008 or 2012. He argues that exports are a cost and imports are a benefit, and it's actually no problem running a trade deficit. Now, that is completely, in, the, in my opinion, completely American-centric, and it's still being repeated by a lot of modern monetary writers, I notice. And that ignores the thing that when you're not the reserve currency, uh, if you're running uh, uh, a deficit, then you are going to face a devaluing uh, currency. You may at some point be unable to issue debt in your own currency and you will be forced to borrow in foreign currency. And that's catastrophic. MMT accepts that. But I don't think they consider the, the implications. And they also don't see the role that if you're running a, if you're running a mercantilist policy and running a surplus, you're effectively outsourcing your money creation. So here I think they're being incomplete in how they think about the, the overall accounts. They're considering private versus public, but they're not considering private non-bank versus private bank, and they're not considering sufficiently domestic versus international. And so my perspective on a country like Germany running a 9% uh, balance of trade surplus is that with that trade surplus, it's effectively outsourcing its production of euros. So if a, if a mm. German company sells a Mercedes to uh, somebody in the UK, the UK will buy euros with pounds and send those euros back, or they'll send pounds to the German, to Mercedes, who the Mercedes will then present those pounds to the ECB. The ECB will credit those pounds in the, in the trade surplus of the European uh, Union, and of course, particularly Germany, uh, and then give that person euros. So effectively, you've outsourced your money creation. Now, this is a reason why running an export service and a mercantilist policy actually works. And I think MMT hasn't sufficiently considered that. So let me paraphrase that just so I understand and, and trying to put it and to simplify it, maybe um, if you are running an economy, there's two ways you can create extra money in that economy. One is that you can, in effect, sell more stuff overseas. So you're getting foreign money coming in rather than just the money that's circulating domestically or the government can print more. And the third way is you take out a loan from the banks. Yeah. So those are the three. And in, so this is the, 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 the magic and the sense behind Wynne Godley's uh, development of this argument over time, and, and it must include for, uh, Francis Cripps, Cripps as well, uh, is that uh, when you look at the flows in each direction, the sum of all the flows has to equal zero because if I put $100 in your account, for example, uh, then there's minus 100 in mine and plus 100 in yours, the sum is zero. Now, that accounting regularity means you can actually identify whether trends in the aggregate are sustainable or not. And that's what Wynne Godley used to, to warn of the financial crisis long before it occurred, because he said the, the trends in the private to public uh, balance are so great that the private non-bank sector has to be getting in debt to the private banks on an unsustainable scale. Therefore, there'll be a crisis. Now, that's a realistic uh, empirical, rather than just sort of saying what we should do, that's the use of a, of a very simple element of MMT to warn of a crisis the mainstream didn't see coming and believes couldn't be predicted. You know, I'm calling bullshit on that, of course. So um, that is a, um, a major benefit of the MMT perspective. And I think, to my point of view, it's not that it's wrong in any sense, it's that it hasn't been sufficiently developed. If everyone was following MMT around the world, what's to stop everyone saying, well, okay, for us to get our full employment in our country, we need to sell more overseas. Therefore, we need to devalue our currency by as much as possible. So we're going to pump as much money into the economy. Everyone else does the same thing. Don't we just have a, a period of devaluation of every currency? Because, of course, it just becomes a trade war because that well, is this, a zero-sum game. This, this, exactly. That's, that's, that, is, that is the only zero-sum game in existence that matters because, of course, banks can create more new loans than old. The government can run... Uh, a, a deficit and create uh, uh, spend more than it taxes they're, they're not constrained there the one constraint is that when somebody's trade deficit must be somebody else's trade surplus right so uh, and and of course the neoclassical theory used to argue anybody running a trade surplus will suffer rampant inflation that'll undermine their currency that'll cause their prices to fall so it'll be a nice equilibrium system yeah look at germany and japan two uh, uh, obvious cases of, of of huge trade surpluses and absolutely rampant Inflation? You've got <laughs> not. to be kidding. <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah. No, okay. yeah. So, so consequently, running mercantilist policies is a highly successful strategy. And in some ways, the WTO should be there to prevent 
and penalize countries that actually do that. And there should be penalties right. on countries that run excessive trade deficits, including Germany. Okay, so that's, um, that's, so that's, so that's your answer to my question. I agree with Trump. Okay, so that's your yeah. answer to my question then. If we, if we, if everyone employed modern monetary theory, then you would have everyone trying to drop their, the value of their currency as much as possible so they could get that trade advantage. Your answer is, well, the, the World Trade Organization would have to police that somehow. Or, or the IMF. The original idea of the IMF from, from Keynes and the, and the Bretton Woods was that it would be a clearinghouse for international trade by issuing bank cores and all trade would be in bank cores, which were a, a, cre- a created currency created proportional to the size of every country's GDP and with fixed exchange rates. So if you actually were running a trade a deficit, you'd be forced to devalue over time because you run out of bank cores. But if you're running a trade surplus, then you'd be required to pay, you'd be taxed on the surplus, and you'd also be required to spend some of that in um, in, in third in, in, in development aid, and you'd also be under pressure to to have run a run a uh, a government deficit uh, to counteract your trade deficit, which would actually ultimately work by driving in demand for more imports. So this is uh, all part of the system we should have had. We didn't because the Americans, as usual, were too bloody arrogant. Mm. Needs to change, perhaps. Well, it don't know perhaps uh. about it. Needs to change. Uh, <laughs> good to talk. Uh, we'll catch you again later on. Uh, in fact, uh, next time, I think we're going to look at uh, regional diversity and uh, uh, whether it makes economic sense to uh, to allow countries to have uh, different income levels, uh, different levels of productivity, and how, what we can do to fix it. We'll do that next time. Thanks uh, for your time, Steve. Welcome, mate. And that is it. That's how we do the Debunking Economics podcast. If you subscribe, you can hear that once or twice a week. I'm Phil Dobby. We'll catch you again soon with Professor Steve Keen. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.